we want you to get connected. If you're new at Evangel, or you've just been with us for a short period of time, my wife and I are doing a class right after this close of this service. It'll be in the new prayer chapel, and it's about 10 minutes with pastors so I can share my heart of who we are as a church and where we're headed. 10 minutes. I just asked for 10 minutes. If you're new in the church and never been to a heart class, we want you to get connected to Evangel and to what's happening. We have the eConnect track. James is over all of that, James Price. And uh, this heart class is very important. But uh, we want to help you find your place in the body. Get connected and be fulfilled. And so, uh, but the heart class is so important. So meet me for 10 minutes in the chapel. We won't keep you long. And uh, right after this service closes. But I want to say something also uh, about discipleship. Discipleship is so important. And we have four pillars that guide this church. Four pillars that in any season of life, those four pillars keep us on track. So that when COVID hit last year, this church never missed a beat, not one beat. Not in any area, not in any area, not one beat. In fact, we actually saw the miracles of God in an amazing way. But it's because four pillars, four foundation stones guide everything we do as a church. And I want to share my heart for just a few minutes. I want you to be a part. But discipleship is so important as one of those pillars. We, we believe in building disciples, not building Christians. And uh, Sunday school, time and time again, in every study of discipleship, comes out ahead, way ahead. When I look at what's happened in America and where our nation is over the last decades and the fall and departure from God, I believe it's because so many churches shut down Sunday school, which is the strongest arm of teaching God's Word. It's proven. The literacy rate, you can check this out, the literacy rate of the Word of God in families across America and in the church, this is what's so telling. The literacy rate of the Word of God in churches is at the all-time low in the history of our nation. And I believe that when we cut out Sunday school, We deprived a generation, generations, of the study of God's Word. I know there's other discipleship programs, but none of them even compare. They don't even get on the same radar as Sunday school. And I want to say to you, Sunday school's important. Discipleship's important. And I want you connected to discipleship. That's a passion in this house, is we're making disciples. Amen? The last thing I want to say before we jump into the Word, I want you to take out your cell phone. I want you to wave it at Pastor. Come on, up that gallery, up in the balcony, come on, see your cell phone. I want you to go on and share this service right now. I believe the Lord has a word for us today. Amen. Share this service, everybody watching online, and welcome to all of our online campus, our Middleburg campus. I want you to share this service right now. Even if you've already done it, do it again. Amen. We're about to jump into, thank you, worship team. Let's give our worship team a, a wonderful thank you for their service and ministry. You can go ahead and turn to 2 Kings, but I want to set the stage for you because how many understand you've got a personal calendar, but God has a calendar? How many would agree that God's calendar is important? All right, on God's calendar are some feast days. There are seven major feasts on God's calendar. We just came through four weeks ago today, one of those major feasts. Three of the seven, God says, you have no choice. You go to the temple. Go to Jerusalem, go to the temple. Three of the seven, they were required. I'd love to have required Sunday attendance. Amen. God did that in the Word. Three of the seven feasts, Passover was one. He said, you have no choice. Go to Jerusalem. That's why the numbers at Passover grew into the millions of people that were in Jerusalem. You know what the next major feast that was required attendance? Pentecost, three weeks from today. He says everyone's required to go to Jerusalem on Pentecost. Why? On those important times, something was about to happen. And he didn't want anybody to miss it. I believe God's got something for America. I believe we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Listen. We need revival in America, and if religion would do it, we'd be a saved nation. We got more churches in America than any other nation, and yet we need revival in this nation. 
with the literacy rate of the Word of God plummeting to an all-time low, and we see all that's happening in our nation, friends, we need a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need a move of God to take place. Pentecost Sunday is three weeks from today. Don't you miss it. I'm believing for a fresh, fresh oil. Somebody say fresh oil. Fresh oil. Hallelujah. We want some fresh oil, but that's a required attendance on God's calendar. So maybe you should put it on your calendar three weeks from today. And uh, Pentecost Sunday, amen. The following Sunday, Jonathan Kahn's gonna be with us. And looking forward to his ministry. All right. 2 Kings chapter 7. I want to show you the deplorable state of a nation and what happens when God's word can be back infused into that nation. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 3. Hallelujah. And there were four lepers, leprous men, at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. We shall die there. If we sit here, we die also. Now therefore, come, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Look here. Israel, Jerusalem is surrounded by the Syrian army under King Benadad. They're surrounded. They have laid siege to the nation and to the city of Jerusalem. It is, you may be seated now. It is so deplorable what has taken place. Watch this. The, the people are starving to death. America has never known this kind of famine. But they are starving to death so much so that they're eating their animals and even eating their own children. That is a deplorable, desperate state. Israel fell into deplorable, a deplorable situation like this because they allowed sin to come into the nation. Moses had predicted in the Torah, in the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, that because of sin, these things would come. I want to remind us of Romans chapter 6, that the wages of sin is death. Everybody say amen. amen. There is payment for sin. When you get connected to sin, when you get involved in sin, the wages of sin is death. The payment for sin is death. I want you to know that somebody paid the penalty for that and you don't have to stay in that sin. You don't have to stay under the wages of that sin. You can be free on this Sunday morning by turning to Jesus. And yet because of sin, Israel was under the siege of the Syrian army. A mighty, mighty army was, was attacking Israel and attacking the city of Jerusalem. The foolishness of sin can never be an excuse to blame the prophet of God. So what happens here is that the king looks at Israel and looks at Elisha and says, you're the reason for all of this famine. You're the reason that Israel is under the attack totally discounting the sin that Israel had fallen into. It's always amazed me that how people's personal sin can make them overlook what God is trying to do, what God is trying to tell them, how God is trying to get their attention, and their personal sin has made them blame something else other than themselves. Israel was to blame, not Elisha. Now, I love the prophet Elisha. He had such an anointing on his life. He was the one that they took the, the dead man's bones and threw into the grave on Elisha and there was such an anointing still on a dead corpse that that man came back to life. Oh, hallelujah. I can stop and preach right there. You talk about some bones rattling and shaking, some bones coming together. You throw a dead man on the corpse of Elisha. Listen, we need some anointing in this hour. There's some dead people going to walk up in this church. They're dead spiritually, and they need to be rubbing shoulders with people that have an anointing on their life, that have the presence of God on their life, uh, the word of the Lord in their life, and that word and, and that anointing is going to help them come out of their sin and be set free. 
whom the Son sets free, he is free indeed. Come on, shout amen. And yet the king blames Elisha. I always try to look for the prophet of God to blame for your, your own misgivings. I, I want to say uh, right here, right up front, don't touch the anointed. That king was already making a mistake. God is very clear in his word. There are several things you do not touch. You don't touch, touch them with your Facebook post. Oh, hallelujah. Boy, I, I, I shake my head sometimes at some of the things I see. People posting, I thought, wow. I, you know, I, I still believe the word of God is true. Amen. I, I believe that things people can incur some things that they really don't want. You need to protect your family, protect your own life, and keep your keep focused on what the main thing is. And the main thing is getting America back to God, getting your family back to God, and understanding that sin is the contagion that has brought about the deplorable state of America. Sin was the contagion that brought about the deplorable state of Israel. The king tears his clothes. You can do all your religious acts all you want. You can try to blame the prophet of God when you got sin going on in your life. And America needs to turn to God and repent of her sin. Hallelujah. I'll come down there and say amen to myself. You don't say amen. Sin will take you further away from God than you really want to be. It'll cause you to do things that you would have never thought you would have done. Why? Because there's deceiving spirits at work in our world today. How many believe that there's deceiving spirits at work in, in the world? When men can believe that good is bad and bad is good, there's deceiving spirits at work. When men believe that they can touch the things of God and get away with it, that's a deceiving spirit. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to put that together. I'm telling you that sin will take you further away from the presence of God and call you, uh, cause you to do things you would have never done. What we need in America is some men like Elisha that in spite of the king's decree, in spite of the religious acts of tearing the clothes, a, a prophet of God named Elisha stood up with the word of the Lord. We need some prophets to stand up in America and get people back in this book. Not what mama said, not what daddy said, not what I believe in my heart, not what I got in a dream somewhere, but what God gave me from his holy book. Listen, Elisha comes along in a starving environment. They're eating their children. And he says, tomorrow, there's gonna be plenty of bread to go around. Tomorrow, we're going to have biscuits and gravy. Tomorrow, we're going to have grits and some hash browns. Hallelujah. Tomorrow, we're going to have some egg McMuffins. Amen. Tomorrow, there's going to be plenty of bread to go around. At this time tomorrow, they've been starving. They're eating their babies. And a prophet with the word of the Lord comes along and he says, in 24 hours, God's about to flip this thing around, turn this thing around. You know what he's doing? He's prophesying a turnaround. I, I, I want to come up in here and say, if we'll get the word of God back in America, there's going to be a turnaround in America. I, I remember one of the great, great men of God that stood in this pulpit several years ago, Reinhard Bonnke, and I honor that man, a, a man of God, and he said, America shall be saved. How many remember? That was such a powerful moment when he prophesied that. I've not, I've not allowed God to rest over what a man said. Uh, that God, you remember him speaking that word. I'm believing that America's gonna turn back to God, back to our scriptural roots, our, our foundational roots, where men begin to call on the name of the Lord and men were seeking a place to worship God in spirit and in truth. We want God back in America again. <laughs> Hallelujah. But only the word of the Lord could cause a man to stand up and say, tomorrow at this time, there's gonna be plenty of bread. Hallelujah. I wanna declare that maybe May is your month of your breakthrough. Maybe this month, as we've entered a new month, uh, that there's gonna be a turnaround. You've been under some things. You've been in a famine time. You've been in a season where you need a breakthrough. You've got some children that are living like hell. Because hell got in their heart. And you need a breakthrough for some family members. I want to tell you, in 24 hours, God can flip some things around. We need to get the word of God. I want everybody that wants a 
a breakthrough in May. Stan, I want you to turn around right now. Come on. You want to turn around. You want to turn around. I want you to turn around. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's give him praise. Come on. Hallelujah. You can be seated. God's word is vital to America turning back to him. We need a sure word of prophecy, not somebody's pipe dream. We need the word of the Lord preached in America. America needs to return to God, and we need prophets and preachers and evangelists. And You know, I had someone a while back tell me they don't believe in those fivefold gifts to the body of Christ today. I thought, well, you need to just tear your Bible up. Just tear it right out of your scriptures. You can't have the New Testament and not believe in apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. You can't even have the Old Testament. What are you going to believe? The Bible says those are needed in this day for the, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Amen? America needs to return to God, and we need the Word of God preached because the Bible says all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Sometimes you need correction from the Word of God, and pastor's going to be here preaching it and telling it. Amen. It just hit my thought. It's not in my notes, but I just remember Pastor Kilpatrick is all one, always one to correct things spiritually as a pastor. And the first time that he had Steve Hill come preach, just a few weeks before the Brownsville revival broke out, he introduced Steve Hill. It was the first time he ever preached at Brownsville. And uh, Pastor Kilpatrick leaned over to Steve and said, Steve, I've got to take care of some pastoral duties and responsibilities as a pastor of this church, and then I'm going to turn it to you. Offerings being taken, finishes, and Pastor Kilpatrick gets up, and he said, I would like for this family right here in the center to please stand, call their name, and he said, today we are officially excommunicating this family from this church. They have been causing dissension and problems in the church, and the deacon board has met. We are excommunicating them from the church. Ushers, please come and escort them out. Steve, you may now preach. That was the first time Steve Hill ever preached for John Kilpatrick. I remember when Steve Hill told me that story. And uh, he said he excommunicated them. Right? They were just troublemakers. They always stirring the pot. And he excommunicated them from the church. Just put them right out, had the deacons escort, and they were not allowed back in. I, I want to tell you, there'd be a lot few church problems if that happened today. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. But the word of the Lord has got to be preached in the pulpits of America. We need the cross being preached. We need the blood of Jesus being preached. We need the name of Jesus being lifted up. Listen, there's places you can't preach about the blood. I want you to know this pulpit's gonna preach about the blood of Jesus. We're gonna preach about the cross. We're gonna preach about an empty tomb. We're gonna preach about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna preach the word of God as my dad used to say, from cover to cover, amen? Hallelujah. God sent Elisha with the word of the Lord. And God knows how to get people's attention. I've watched that through the years. God knows how to get people's attention. Hear the word of the Lord, Elisha says. This time tomorrow, there's going to be plenty of meal, plenty of fine flour being sold, plenty of bar barley uh, that can be used. And they were going to have plenty of food on the next day. So there was a sure word that was given by a prophet. The lepers did something. I want to point that out very quickly. The lepers did something. They were not content to sit by. They were seated. They were leprous men. They were not wanted back in the city because of their leprosy. They were leprous men. They sure wouldn't have been wanted into the Syrian camp, but they did something. They got up. You may use every kind of situation to say, Pastor, I'm not going to be involved. I'm not going to be connected for this reason, that reason, or another reason. I want you to know the lepers could not sit any longer. They had to do something. 
your starvation or your family situation, your, your defunct, dysfunctional family or, or dysfunctional situations in life, they've got to drive you to your knees where you cry out to God, enough is enough. I've got to have an answer from heaven. I've got to have God show up and turn some things on a, a, around for me, a breakthrough in the month of May. I'm not willing to just sit here any longer while people are dying on my right and people are dying on my left. I've got family that are headed into eternity without Christ. Enough is enough. Enough, and we're not going to sit here till we die. I believe that's the posture of the church in this hour. Amen. Pastor, I don't have a whole lot to give. All you got to give is a little because little as much as when God is in it. Amen. Faith will cause you to do something. These lepers did something. They got up and started to go into the Syrian camp. An incredible army was poised and sieging the nation and the city. But friends, there was a miraculous defeat. It says that in these verses that the Lord made the Syrian people to hear. I'm praying you'll hear something this morning. I'm praying something to get in your spirit this morning from the Holy Ghost. Listen, how many believe the Holy Spirit still talks to people? I'm always a little leery because, you know, the prophets that I know never hang out a shingle. People that have spiritual gifts never hang out a shingle. So when people say, I've got this, that, that, and that, and all, all the other working in my life, I say, okay, yeah, sure. Because most of the people that I know don't ever announce it. You don't have to articulate it. You're, you're, the fruit being born from your life will articulate that, amen? People will know the tree by its fruit that it bears. And, and this, all of a sudden they begin to hear something. And the Syrian army heard an angelic host. How many believe in angels? Now, I, I want to know. I'm going to look across this entire congregation. How many believe in angels? Just hold it up there. Amen. I want to know that you believe in angels. Listen, I believe in the ministry of angels. My wife and I call for angels. We pray for angels to be present every day and minister to the heirs of salvation. They're sent along side to assist us to help us to cover us amen to do things that we can't do and we need that ministry and God caused the Syrian army that was sieging his people I want you to know there's some sieging that's been going on against your children your family your loved ones this city this nation there's some sieging that's been going on that we need an angelic army to show up in this hour don't discount angels in this hour Hallelujah. I believe in those beings that God sends that miraculously turn things around and turn a situation around that was plaguing Israel so much so that they're eating their children. The Syrians heard something. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, let us hear what's happening in the spirit realm. Come on, just close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. Holy Spirit, help us to hear what's happening in the spirit realm. Let there be some demonic spirits dislodged today. Let there be some uh, spirits that have been aggravating people be dislodged today. Send some angels on assignment right now and dislodge some Syrians. Hallelujah. But not only was there a miraculous defeat, friends, there was something else. There was a miraculous provision that was about to take place. There were some steps of faith. Some lepers got up and began to walk out into the camp of the Syrians. They went out there twice. Sometimes once is not enough. You need to go out there again and look and see. Amen? Hallelujah. They went out and looked, and the first tent they came to, there were no soldiers there, but there was food and there were spoils of war. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got a word for somebody right now. May, may be your month that you're about to enter some spoils of war, amen. There's some spoils that have been clogged up, some spoils that belong to you. The enemy's been, he's been working overtime to defeat you and to work against you, and there comes a time you need to go look in the end. I went to the enemy's camp, and I took, remember that, John? Oh, we sang that many a revival service. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You need to go to the enemy's camp and say, take your hands off of my stuff. There's some spoils that belong to me. There's some spoils that belong to the body of Christ. 
I want you to know that those leprous men went into a tent, pulled open the tent, and there were no soldiers, but there's a cheeseburger. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. There's some salmon over an Asian salad. That's what I'm gonna have for lunch today, so that's why I said that, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They saw some food there, and then they saw, they saw some spoils, and they went and hid the spoils. They went back a second time, and they thought, wow, this is good, but we can't hold our peace. There's a city that's starving to death. I, I want you to know there's two things here that I want to close with. Number one, I believe we're about to enter a time. The devil's been stealing. He's been pilfering. One, one of the greatest ways that I believe the devil steals, he steals the word of God out of your life. How are you gonna be victorious? You got the word of God. And if he steals, remember Jesus gave this parable about the wicked one that comes to steal the seed. If the devil can steal the word out of your life, he's keeping you from victory. He's keeping you. He keeps you if he keeps you from this book, then sin's gonna enter your life. That book will keep sin out of your life. That book will cause the blessings of God to, uh, to occur in your life. And so the wicked one comes to steal the seed of the word. Disconnect from the word. Disconnect from the truth. Because the more of the word, the more of the truth, God's going to honor his word above his name. He don't want you in Sunday school. He don't want you in Bible teaching, Bible training, preaching of the gospel. He wants, to, he wants America to hear sermons that, that don't have a whole lot of word to them, don't have a lot of scripture, don't have a lot of importance of, and value of the word because if he can keep them from the word, friends, he is in essence stealing, killing, and destroying. Am I telling the truth? And so, friends, we've got to be people of the word. You've got to love that book. You can't go a day without that book. You've got to get in that book. And that word's got to get in your spirit. Amen? There's some yokes that will not be destroyed without the anointing. Isaiah 10, 27 says, On that day, his burden is going to be lifted from off my shoulder, his yoke from off my neck, and the anointing is going to break that yoke. Hallelujah. There was miracle, miraculous provision spoils of war that I believe God wants some people to enter in and to make. I want everybody to stand. I want the worship team to come back, but I'm not finished preaching, so don't go anywhere. Hallelujah. How many need a miraculous breakthrough and provision in May? You want to see that happen. They went back that second time. Wow, there's enough cheeseburgers here to feed the whole city. Amen. Hallelujah. There's enough collard greens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I like collard greens and cornbread, and I had not had any in a while, honey. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. We do not well, they said to one another. Now, here's four brothers. They're all in the same plight. They got leprosy, but they got a lot of food, and they got a lot of spoils. And they said something. We do not well if we sit here and enjoy all this and a city's dying and a nation's starving. We sit here, and this is a great crowd on a Sunday morning, First Sunday of May. You know, we've got a large group of young people up in the gym right now having their own service. Beautiful buildings, properties. And yet there's a world out here that's going to hell. My wife and I have had to be a part, and I don't say had to, I just mean it in a different way, but of so many funerals in the last 14 to 16 months. And our hearts have just had two funerals last Monday. And your heart goes out in so many situations. So many situations. How can we sit here on Sunday morning when you know, beautiful buildings, properties, everything is good, and yet a lost world is there. 
and people are headed into hell, eternal hell. They're languishing. They're dying. We've got to preach the word. We've got to let this nation know there's a better way. We've got to pray for our leaders. There will be a spiritual revival go on. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're not where you ought to be with Jesus, friends, this pastor can't sit here in this environment and know that there's people dying and going into eternity without Christ. That their soul is in the balances. You got, it's no time to play games. It's no time to get sidelined and off track, get out of God's will. I've told my wife, and she can tell you, a lot of times over the last 16 months, I just can't believe people getting out of the will of God with all that's going on in our world. I just can't believe it. I cannot believe it. I shake my head. How many people I've watched just get out of God's will? And, and the signs are so clear. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. And if you know you're not where you ought to be with the Lord, I want you to come to this altar immediately, right now. I want you to move from where you're standing. If you're not where you ought to be with Christ, if you've lost your intensity for the Lord, if you've lost your passion for the things of God, that ought to be a, a, a whistle going off in your spirit. I need to get back to where I, my first love, I've lost my first love. I've lost my first love. If you know you need to pray, I want you to move from where you are right now and come to this altar. Come on. Come on. If you know you need to be at this altar, I invite you to come right now. Right now. If you're not where you ought to be spiritually. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Are there others? Come on. Could I have a, one more deacons? God bless you, sir. God bless you. Come on, kneel it. Know what these steps here. Can we have some men come pray with these men? Come on. If you know you need to be, listen, there's some people that need to come to this altar right now. If you were to die today, if you were to die today, listen to pastor. Would heaven be your home for eternity? If you cannot 100% say yes, you need to come to this altar right now. If you were to die today, would, do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt you'd go straight to heaven? It's not being a good person. It's being a disciple of Christ. Mama, young person, young adult, senior citizen, what about it? If you're not where you ought to be, I invite you to come to this altar right now. If you know there's a spiritual need, you ought to be running to this altar. One of the men standing in this room right now said, Pastor, thanks. Thank you for Wednesday night altar calls because it was on a Wednesday night that I gave my life to Christ. He told me that a week or two ago. Listen, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's not about being a good person, not about going to church, but you know that you're born again, that you are a disciple of Christ. If you can't answer that, yes, I want you to come to this altar real quick. I'm not going to hold this entire church family any longer, but I know there's people that need to move from the balconies, the galleries right now, under the balcony. You need to come right now. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? You do not want to go to hell for eternity. You don't want your family and your loved ones to go to hell for eternity. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and I want everyone in this room, and everyone online, all of our online campus, I want everybody to repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you laid your life down. I receive you into my heart. Forgive me of all my sins. Cover me with your precious blood that all my sins are forgiven because of my faith in you. With your help, I will begin to live and serve you. 
In your name I pray. Come on, let's lift up a shout to the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to speak the ironic blessing over everyone in just a moment. Two things I want you here tonight. I'm asking you to be here. You will be blessed by the word Pastor John preaches tonight. Secondly, if you're new in the church in the last number of months, you've never been to a heart class with Pastor, give me 10 minutes in the chapel, 10 minutes. We won't keep you, but I want to get you connected. I want to help you find your place in this local fellowship. Would you lift your hands for the ironic priestly blessing? The Lord spake unto Moses, said, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying on this wise, This is how you will bless my children, the children of Israel. You are grafted in. You're a part of his children. Galatians 3.13 says we're a part of that family through Christ. Saying unto them, The Lord bless thee, and the Lord keep thee. And the Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Verse 26, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. I'm gonna stop right there and I want everybody to look at pastor. A Jewish rabbi explained how God lifts up his countenance. God's up there, we're down here. How can God lift up his countenance? What do the fathers do? They pick their children up. So he picks you up and he lifts up his countenance. That ought to make your heart beat a little stronger right now. God is lifting you up and he's lifting his, he's lifting his vision up to look at what he's holding up high. Hallelujah. I could run around this room on that one right there. He'll lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name. You put God's name all over your family. Cover your family with his names, the names of God. And God says, I will bless them. Come on, let's worship as they sing. Lead us in.